mercy and peace. These are the wonderful blessings that we gain through our dear friend, our suffering Savior, Jesus Christ. The portion of God's word that we will focus on today is the first <laughs> sentence that Jesus Christ spoke from the cross. It's recorded in Luke chapter 23, verse 34. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. In the name of Christ Jesus, dear fellow believers, honey, I love you. Those were the words that a suffering man was saying through his oxygen mask. He was in ICU. He was an elderly gentleman, been married to his good wife for 52 and a half years. She could barely hear the words because of the oxygen mask and the machines that were in that room trying to keep him alive. The family had been told that he was very close to death. All the family was there. He glances over to his dear, faithful wife, and he says those words that were you know, very wonderful to hear, but still very hard to listen to. Honey, I love you. And then a very short time later, then he breathed his last. Now it was 11 years later, and there was a family reunion. Everybody was there, including Grandma. And she brought it up again. She said, I just, I'll never forget those final words of Grandpa looking at me through that oxygen mask saying, Honey, I love you. You could just tell the way Grandma described the words that she hung on to those words. Those words were inspirational. Those words had given her strength all those years and would continue to do so as long as she lived. Honey, I love you. Last words of a dying man. And of course, I think you know where I'm going with this. In our Lenten series this year, we're going to be taking a look at the last words of Jesus, the words that he spoke before he breathed his last. There are seven sentences total, and tonight we have the privilege of looking at the first sentence, spoken by our Savior Jesus shortly after they drove the nails. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. We're going to take a look at these words and see that these are, first of all, evidence for the deep love that Jesus Christ has for you and for me and for all sinners. And also these words are an excellent example for you and me to follow in our relationships with other people, with people in our family, people who are our enemies, and everybody in between. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. So what's really amazing about these words is that Jesus Christ was suffering so much when he spoke these words. So I, I think a good illustration would be something like this. If you were, let's say you were on a cruise, maybe you want a cruise, or you just thought to yourself, hey, we're just going to splurge on ourselves. We're going to take a cruise. We're going we're to take a, one of those big ships going from New York City down to the Caribbean. We're just going to have a, a really fun time cut loose. And then you're maybe 100 miles off the southern tip of Florida, and you're hit with a squall. And the ship is rocking back and forth, and you hear an explosion of some kind, and then the ship is taking on water. What would your response be? Would you be cursing at the captain? For not checking the weather report, at least getting everybody into some sort of safe port? Would you be disgusted and angry at the people who designed the ship so that it wouldn't be so that, to prevent it from going down in that fashion? What would your thoughts be? Would you be thinking, I know I wouldn't be thinking this, would you be thinking about the spiritual lives of other people? Would you be asking God to forgive the captain? Would you be asking God to forgive the people who designed the ship? Would you be praying for the, the relationship of all the people involved, even the other people on the ship, their relationship with God, that God would somehow bless that relationship and mend that relationship? That's what Jesus did. Probably the last thing you and I would do, but that's what Jesus did, the love of our Savior Jesus, by speaking these words. Just six hours Earlier, Jesus had been betrayed by one of his trusted friends. You know, when Jesus Christ said there in the upper room, you just heard the words, 
He said, one of you is, is going to betray me. The disciples were at a loss to know which one was he was referring to. And they couldn't figure it out. Judas had not given a clue in anything that he said or any actions at all that he was going to be the betrayer. But he betrayed Jesus. Jesus trusted him. Jesus made him the treasurer of the disciples. And this Judas betrayed the location of Jesus. He went to the enemies of Jesus. And he said, you will be able to arrest him in the garden. And you will, he won't be surrounded by a lot of people. This would be a great time to arrest him. The pain and the hurt that Jesus was experiencing in that time. You've probably been betrayed by a friend or two. And you multiply that by about 500 times, the pain and the hurt of Jesus. And then it was the Jews that arrested Jesus. These were the Jews that Jesus loved. He preached to the Jews hundreds of sermons to try to save their souls. He performed miracles in the presence of the Jews so that they would trust in him as their savior. And what do they do? They come at him with clubs and swords and they hit him in the face and they spit at him and they bind him up like some kind of criminal. And then, then there were the Romans. The Romans who whipped Jesus. I guess I've explained that in countless sermons how the Roman whip was especially cruel with those jagged things on the end that just ripped the flesh. That's the kind of suffering that Jesus had gone through prior to this. Prior to the time when he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The love that is in our Savior's heart for sinners. And then, just before this time, they drove those large nails. They went right through the hands. And the doctors, and even you know this, of all the places in your body that's just filled with nerve endings, it's the hands and the feet, right? And they took those nails and just drove them right through the hands. One in each hand, and then one nail going through both feet, put him up on that cross, lifted that cross into a hole, and dropped it in with a thud. And again, doctors tell us that there is, there is no worse way to die than by crucifixion. The, the word excruciating comes from the word crucifying. But we do not hear any cursing or obscenities from the lips of Jesus. You know, sites of crucifixion were places where parents just did not take kids. This kind of language that came from crucified people, uh, that was not, nothing that, that kids should hear because a lot of times it was filled with curses and angry words and violent words and obscene words. But in all of his pain, all we hear from Jesus is praying. He prays, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Think about what that really means. Father, forgive them. That includes Judas. Father, please forgive Judas. Judas, whom I love. Father, please forgive the crowd. The crowd that is angry. The crowd that shouted out, crucify him, crucify him. Father, forgive the crowd. Father, forgive the Roman soldiers. Those Roman soldiers treated Jesus Christ like he was not a human being, but he was just some kind of cheap animal. Think of it. He says, Father, forgive them. Jesus wanted them all forgiven. What an amazing love in the heart of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And what's really amazing is that Jesus Christ still prays that prayer. Perhaps you remember this from your confirmation class, either youth confirmation class or adult confirmation class, that one of the things that Jesus is doing right now is he is interceding for us. That's one of his roles up there in heaven. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8, Christ is at the right hand of God interceding for us. And you wonder, well, what kind of prayer is he praying for us? Well, it's this kind of prayer. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Oh, sometimes we act like Judas, don't we? Money hungry, not wanting to give to the poor, not wanting to support the work of the church, not wanting to help other people out because we want that money for ourselves. We're acting just like Judas there. But what does Jesus say from heaven's throne? How does he intercede for us? 
He says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. Sometimes we act like the crowd and just go along with the crowd. It's very common for Christians to say, oh, what is sex before marriage? No big deal. Look at our society. Everyone's doing that. So it's okay for us to do that. It's okay for us to condone that kind of behavior. How sinful that is. How wicked that is. To have that attitude. To have those thoughts. But what does Jesus Christ say from heaven's throne? How does he intercede for us? He says, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they're doing. And sometimes we're just like those brutal, brutal Roman soldiers in our thoughts. Hasn't it ever happened to you? I know it's happened to me, to my shame, where if someone's been cruel to me, I kind of say, oh, I wish something bad would happen to them. I wish that at least they'd slam their finger on a door or something. Or have an accident in a car. Wake them up a little bit, right? Those are angry, vicious thoughts, kind of like the Roman soldiers. And what does our Savior do? He intercedes for us. He says, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. Where can we find a love like that? Where can we find a love like that? Well, we look at our Savior Jesus. We look at how he loved us. You know, there's an there's a art gallery in Texas. I forget the city now. It's someplace down there in Texas. It just has Christian art. I always wanted to go there. And there was a black man who was there. He was visiting the art gallery. He saw this graphic picture of the crucifixion of Jesus. And it was very well done. Was, Jesus was there. The two criminals were there. And the women were there at the base of the cross. And there were also the enemies of Jesus that were reviling Jesus. And he was just looking at it. He was looking at it for a long time. And and he said, he thought he was saying this under his breath, but I guess he was saying out loud. He just said, Jesus, I love you. And then there was another man that came up behind him and said, Brother, I love him too. Tonight, dear friends, let's take a look at Jesus. Let's take a look at his suffering for us. Let's hear the prayer. Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. And let's agree with that man. Jesus, I love you. Let's, let's acknowledge his love for us and vow to return that love to our dear Savior. And that brings us really to the second point that Jesus Christ in praying this prayer is an ex, a wonderful, wonderful example for us. So Jesus Christ talked about love a lot in his ministry. I don't think I have to illustrate that. Always talking about love. One time someone came to him and, and said, what is, the, what is the sum and substance of the, of the word of God and, 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 and God's law? And he said, well, love God and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus is always talking about love. And we talk a lot about love too. We just had Valentine's Day. Think about the people that we love. And we talk a lot about love in the church. But it's also hard to practice what we preach, isn't it? It doesn't take much. It doesn't take much to, to turn that love switch off. Our spouse can just look at us a certain way, and we say, why did she look at me like that? You know? And all of a sudden, the love just evaporates. It doesn't take much. Our boss can say kind of a, what he thinks is constructive criticism, but we take it kind of like personal criticism. Also, I don't like my boss anymore. I think I'll look for a different job. Doesn't take much for us to kind of ruin our aspirations to put all of our talk about love into practice. But think about Jesus Christ. Think about what he did. He not only talked about love, but he put it into practice. He really lived it. And the proof of that is the cross. The proof of that is his first sentence coming from the cross. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Now, some Christians, at some little high points in their lives, have matched this. They've matched this love. Stephen, remember Stephen? First Christian martyr. They were throwing rocks at him until he died, but before he died, he said these words are quoted in the Bible, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. Where did he learn that? He learned that from Jesus, didn't he? 
He was using Jesus as an example. Another man, there was this man that lived about 100 years before Martin Luther. And he had the same ideas as Martin Luther, but he was not as fortunate as Martin Luther because he was arrested. And they were going to burn him at the stake. And as they lit the fire, and as the fire is coming up and about ready to take his life, he said, a quote, Lord, do not put this sin to their account. Where did he learn this? Well, he learned it, of course, from Jesus Christ, who prayed, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. So, dear friends, this kind of love, this kind of love we can learn from Jesus, take him as an example. There is uh, an old saying, and I think you ladies can probably agree with me 100%, that springtime is a time for house cleaning. How many of you had that thought? As these temperatures are warming up, you say, you know, I'm kind of getting the urge to clean the house. There's another saying in the church that Lent is a time for heart cleaning. It's a time for us to bury the hatchet. It's a time for us to let go of those grudges. Those people in our families that have hurt us, those people in our church families that have maybe said some things to us that were not very kind, let's just let go of those things. And if we have a difficult time with that, as all of us by nature are going to do, then it's time for us to turn to the Word. It's time for us to turn to Jesus Christ and hear what he says. He says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And let's remember that as he prays that prayer, he is praying for you and he is praying for me. As we listen to that, as we think about that, tremendous power the Holy Spirit gives us then to use Jesus as our example. May God grant it for Jesus' sake and for the growth of his kingdom. Amen. Dear friends, let's respond to the sermon that we heard by singing the song. It's on the bottom of page one. The uh, words are new, but the melody is familiar. Hymn 436, verse 1. Okay. 